Okay, so hi, I'm Laura Murphy. I'm a PhD student in Trinity College Dublin, and I'm delighted to be chairing this panel discussion today. Um, this is the second in a series of online events as part of the Invisible exhibition in Science Gallery in Dublin. Um, so Invisible investigates fundamental physics, matter, materiality, concepts of invisibility. It also um, investigates invisibility of people in science, um, so underrepresentation of minority groups. It originated in London um, in 2019 in King's College, um, where it was titled Dark Matter. So today we're going to be talking about why does dark matter matter? Um, so I'm joined here by Yu Chen Wang, um, who is one of the artists um, as part of this exhibit and two physicists, Malcolm Fairbairn um, and Shamkar Gag. Um, so just before we kick off, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. So Yu Chen, if you would like to start. Hi, um, I'm Yu Chen Wang. Um, well, I'm an artist um, originally from Taiwan, but I've been based in the UK for over 20 years already. Um, so I don't really know whether if I'm Taiwanese or British, um, I guess it doesn't matter, but I make drawings, um, video work and installation work, um, everything you can name it except paintings. I don't do paintings. Cool. Thanks, Yu Chen. So Malcolm, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Malcolm Furburn. I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm originally from Wigan in the northwest of England, and I'm a theoretical physicist, so I don't do any experiments. And I work at the intersection of uh, particle physics and astrophysics and I mainly work on dark matter, and I work at King's College London. Lovely, thanks. Shamkar then? Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Sham. Um, so I'm uh, originally from Kent, uh, so um, yeah, not so far from where I work now, which is um, University College London. Uh, and I'm a physicist as well, but I'm the um, sort of the inverse uh, of Malcolm. Now, I, I don't do any theory, but I do lots of experimental physics, so I, I build stuff and try to detect things like dark matter um, that, that are sort of proposed by theories um, from folk like Malcolm. Lovely, great. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to show some video um, of Yu Chen's piece, There's More To It Than Meets The Eye. Um, so I'm going to ask Yu Chen just to introduce that for us um, so that you know a little about what you're about to see. Oh, I'll mute myself. Um, well, um, the title itself, it's kind of self-explanatory and it's very much about what, what to see. And I'm very interested in the notion of seeing. And I guess as a visual artist, that's kind of fundamental for, for, for my practice. And in this case, it's kind of step into um, a little bit of from the scientific um, research uh, perspective. Um, I guess everyone knows we can't see dark matter but we can see the effect. And I guess that becomes a very interesting backbone for um, this piece in particular. Um, this piece is very much about my interaction with various um, physicists um, um, like Malcolm and, and Chum. And, and so my interaction of visiting them and meeting them and speaking, learning everything about science. It's very much about my sort of personal journey. Um, but this piece, it isn't just the video of what you're actually going to see now. Um, so there's the script writing, um, then the script then becomes spoken words, and then it's been performed by the science um, communicate, um, some science communicator, Helen Arney, and there's this drawing of various apparatus, um, you know, various, um, mechanical parts which we use in the um, experiment. And then there's this compression of video and audio, um, uh, video and audio um, cocktail, if you like, um, into this projection and that then turn into an installation work. And um, so I guess later on we slowly unfold this um, multi-layer, um, which is very sort of typical way of how I uh, make my work which is very relational and it's about my experience with this scientific labs or this scientific research 
or my relationship with um, the scientists um, I have been working with, and as well as the um, collaborators, um, including Helen Arney, who's um, delivering the voiceover and also the sound design by Capital K. Um, so there's many, many different layers. Um, I guess um, after you watch the video, you probably will get to know a lot more um, what I'm talking about. Brilliant. But you're different. You're willing to struggle. Your voice gives a sense of reassurance, and I'd like to think it's a sign of approval. I'm a student you never had. Without dedicated years of study and research, without even knowing the basics, having these meetings with you, I'm trying to navigate myself through this strange path of learning, finding a way into science or a way into thinking about science, let's put it that way. Still keen to learn, despite the fact there are so many brain-bending and mind-boggling moments, and I'd quite like to know why I'm still interested. What is known is that there's a lot you don't know. But, but how do you know what you know? It's one of the most frustrating things ever to have a description that works so well at predicting what you're going to see in the experiment, but it fails to fully describe some other stuff out there. You're again descending. Seven minutes in a mineshaft elevator is too short to glance through geological history, too long to wait before returning to the experiment you've spent your life working on. Going 1,100 meters deep, you're escaping from unavoidable background radiation, the lingering smell of the miner's sweat, the flow of heat from the semi-molten magma, somewhere a little closer to the center of the earth, where dark matter mining is in progress. The most sensitive detector with mechanical eyes and ears patiently awaits the first signal. If you ever do catch the moment of a wimp colliding with a xenon nucleus, well, you're trying to capture the unpicturable. And at the same time, picture the uncapturable. The calculations will lead to an actual measurement. You and your machines are slowly becoming part of history, oh, yes. of physics, and, and of no astronomy, bananas and maybe walnuts eventually your machine. Of geology. Uh, they're a bit radioactive. Calculations show that many galaxies Looking out in space and back in time, they do if they do you observe the in the dark. You dark just matter. need to tweak gravity secretly to keep everything in place. Zooming into the smallest astronomical observations of the and back out again to the infinite from the formation and evolution of galaxies, you from mass location during galactic collisions and from the motion of galaxies within galaxy clusters. You want to see it's been born again. Born again. Again, 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 again. Matter tells space. A high how speed to hurricane curve. of dark space matter is hurtling through the Milky Way and it's heading straight for Earth. The invisible mass is travelling at a breakneck 310 miles per second. It's all going too fast. Have, Have you missed, missed the glow? glow? A, faint a faint and luminous, luminous signal of dark matter, matter particles smashing into each other and in the process transforming, transforming from, from something invisible, invisible to something, something visible. It was always reaching closer to nothing but didn't become nothing. Is it possible to produce something? from nothing. <laughs> you can't find what's not you there. You can't find it the way that you're looking. Still can't find dark matter? Try to make some in the lab. As long as you've got the right ingredients. If one variety of dark matter can clump together, dark matter it could only form a panoply with of gravitational unimagined dark structures. It is simply mass in other it could dimensions up into dark stars that could surrounded be by the dark fourth dimension made of and the fifth atoms. and the sixth. In the Not most extravagant the three you and I live in, this new kind of dark matter might even allow the existence of dark It means that there's no way you will ever detect it right other than what you've already seen that pulls on knowing. It's unknowable because it's untestable. Neutrinos Quantum 
Quantum Chromodynamics Axions Axion Line Particles Fuzzy Cold Modified gravity, modified Newtonian dynamics, macroscopic tensor magnetoscalar gravity, entropic gravity with primordial black hole. Modified gravity, modified Newtonian dynamics, tensor Vector scalar massive compact halo objects modify the laws of gravity. Scientific fact is a fact only until it's proved wrong, like trying to disprove the validity of science. Well, it's just the best way to answer the questions you have for now. Philosophical speculation. You know, there's more to everything than you've got down into one equation. So you know it's going to break down Agrees somewhere. If you're mathematics. going to describe everything, then a small equation has to fail somewhere. And then you end up having another model Exhaust trying to describe the same the possibilities. thing all over again. I'm learning how to learn and trying to understand what I understand. I think you're like a filter for me filtering through all this information. You say, in fact, that you're not a filter, but a lens that is to focus and see farther Science and beyond. Is an almost never-ending process, trying to converge on something that is as truthful as possible, but you never know if anything is ultimately true. You only know to what level you'll be able to test To try it. to understand, that's what keeps you going. You realise something is missing in your understanding, or maybe you're Passing simply asking from the wrong question. To myth. There's happiness in At doubting. At the end of the day, nature will give its verdict. Nature will decide which one is the correct answer. Okay, so you, Chen. If you would mind, could you tell us a bit about uh, the idea behind the piece? So what drew you to dark matter and to uh, depicting this research? Um, well, this um, the idea behind this piece was very much about um, sort of outlining my own experience, um, in particular speaking to various scientists and also visit um, scientific labs such as CERN or um, wondering um, sort of navigating myself um, within this whole science communication. And um, for me, it's... Um, problematic because there's too much I don't know and I guess um, most of uh, uh, quite a lot of scientists will probably say the same thing like they don't know and there's just they, they, there's too much that we don't know um, but therefore how do I even um, start and I guess um, the way how I sort of start developing this piece um, was very much about um, meeting scientists um, for example meeting uh, Malcolm and meeting um, Charm and um, through those um, meetings, um, I ask a lot of questions, I ask a lot of um, probably silly questions, I suppose. Um, and I, I guess it, it, it's also becoming kind of interesting um, when, when we have this luxury of having face-to-face -face communication with scientists, um, you can just say, hey, Malcolm, sorry, it doesn't make any sense. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you just stop there? And they will find a different way of um, trying to um, explain those um, uh, various um, different concepts. And for me, I, I think that's that's brilliant. And um, in a sense, like it's very um, interactive. But then um, it, it kind of triggers me wanting to know more and more. Um, so the way how I tackle it is um, so like very much, uh, pretty much like um, a lot of work I do. Um, there's a lot of research um, I spent on a lot of time sitting in the archive, um, like sitting, um, spending numerous time um, in um, inside Sun's archive, for example, and looking at a lot of old um, documentations or um, old images, um, for example. Um, so going to um, go on to do a residency. Um, in a place and visiting um, 
you know, the, the scientific lab in this case, um, it's kind of a, an important in part of, um, you know, the way how I develop my work. Um, so the way how I tackle it is um, when I go and visit different scientists, I will recall our conversation and then I bring back this um, recording and I start to make drawings. Um, so, and also these drawings are used uh, um, I kind of collect a lot of um, different um, images, whether they are um, the, from the archive or the blueprints. And in this case, um, in particular, the dark matter search, um, in a sense, it's actually cutting edge science. It's what we, uh, the, the, the whole experiment still being sort of developed. And so when I listen back to all these recordings and um, also to look back all these images that I have collected throughout my research, then I started to write um, stories. Um, so this text is based very much about I and you, and you is the multiple you. So this you is Malcolm and this you is Chum and various other scientists I have spoken to. And it's very much about outlining my own sort of journey. And so if you like, if you think about this text, it's one there, and then the drawing is another layer. And slowly um, in the um, exhibition, um, I guess um, if um, we can bring some um, images into um, this discussion, mm -hmm. yeah. um, if we could show the, um, the first one and two images, these are the drawings. Um, don't know if that drawing is being, oh yeah, there you go. Um, so the way how I make my drawing is quite particular. Um, it's very much, um, I would do it on the table. Um, so when, when I do this, this drawing is about two meters long. So when I make my drawing on the table, it becomes very problematic because I only see part of um, the, 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 the drawing um, I'm making. And also I don't make any preparatory work. And it's up with an even more problem because it's almost I'm growing this machine and this machine is, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's actually real um, blueprints from uh, different um, experiments, but then there's quite a lot of them were actually, um, I made them up. Um, as I go along. And so it's almost like I'm trying to pretend to be a, this researcher or while I'm like this um, engineers, I'm slowly sort of uh, um, growing my own machines. Um, should I continue to talk more? I mean, I, I'm dying to hear more. I'm just worried at this point that there might be people watching who still don't know what dark matter is. So yes. I, think I, might, I might bring in Malcolm here for a second to enlighten us. Um, so Malcolm, could you tell us a little bit about what dark matter is and why it matters? Huh. Well, okay. So um, when you see the, the planets go around the sun, we've got the laws of gravity, which we think are working okay. And you look at the earth going around the sun and we know how much the sun weighs and it all makes sense because of the force of gravity. But when we look at stars going around galaxies in the outer parts of galaxies, they're moving around a lot faster than they should be when we take into account all the mass in the galaxy that we can see. And then when we look at galaxies, lots and lots of galaxies that are together in a galaxy city called like, a, cause a lot of galaxies live in cities. We kind of live in a galaxy village, but a lot of galaxies live in these big cities of galaxies that are called clusters of galaxies. And the speed with which they fall around each other due to their mutual gravity, it tells you um, how much mass there is in them. And there seems to be a lot more stuff there than what we can see. And, and, and for example, Einstein's equation, well, Einstein's theory of general relativity told us that the universe is expanding and nobody believed that for a while, but then we saw that the universe really is expanding. And then we measure how quickly the universe is expanding. And it turns out to explain how quickly it's expanding, there needs to be a lot of stuff there that we can't see. So all these different things from different kinds of observations lead to the same conclusion, which is there's some stuff, lots and lots of stuff out there that, that we can't see. So how, how do we talk about that? So, I mean, I can see the computer because it's creating light, or I can see things in my room because particles of light are bouncing off them and coming to my eyes. This stuff, whatever it is out there, light doesn't bounce off it and it doesn't create any light. So that's why we call it dark matter, but you could call it invisible matter if you wanted to. And there's, there's much more of that stuff than there is normal stuff, the atoms and electrons and neutrons and protons. So we don't know what that is. And what we do at, at King's is we spend a lot of time trying to come up with crazy ideas about what it might be and trying to figure out if there's ways that people can test that and find out if we're right or not. 
which is kind of how science works. Yeah. And I suppose that's where you come in then, Shankar, because you are trying to find this. You're trying to detect it, right? So could you tell us a little bit about the experimental side of how we might finally see dark matter? Yeah. So, so as Malcolm just said, you know, we, we've got all this this extra stuff out there, invisible matter or dark matter, but but the idea is that it's that it's matter. You know, it's it's we, we're we're seeing this dark matter out there that's um, having an influence on things we can see. You know, there's a gravitational influence there at least, and and so let's say it's stuff. You know, it's actually it's uh, and then we there's lots of theories that say it's you know it's a it's a particle born in the early early universe, and so. The, the idea goes like this, that we're essentially surrounded by this. There's one, there's a, a popular or a, um, theory uh, that says dark matter might be made up of weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. And, and so if, if dark matter is made up of WIMPs, then um, we would have, I don't know what it is, it's you know, many, uh, half a million or so WIMP particles going through a fingernail um, every second at about 220 kilometers a, 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 a second or so, you know, half a million miles an hour or so. So we don't we don't feel those. These aren't these aren't interacting with us. They're just sort of whizzing through us. Or, or rather, you know, as the as the, the the Earth is going around the Sun and the Sun's going around, you know, uh, uh, is moving around in the galaxy. Um, it's sort of moving into this this wimp halo that's all around our galaxy. And so we sort of experience this wimp wind coming at us, and that's that's quite. That's quite useful because now we can set up a sort of a game of cosmic snooker, if you like. We can have um, targets, um, you know, detectors essentially on Earth uh, that are moving um, or, or essentially stationary on Earth, but are experiencing this wimp wind sort of coming at them, you know, many particles sort of coming through. Here and there, maybe if we're lucky, the weakly interacting part um, of these massive particles says that sometimes you might get one of them bounce off. Um, a, a target nucleus. So that would be all well and good. That, and that, that presumably is happening all the time. You know, dark matter is going through my body. It might be bouncing off here and there off of one of my, you know, atoms in my body, but that's no good to me. But first off, it's only happening once every hundred years or so. Um, but the other thing is, even if it were to happen, what am I going to do with that? No one will believe me. Right? Uh, so, so we build these detectors um, that, that are just really very sensitive radiation detectors in essence. Uh, so that any dark matter particle that comes in and does sort of scatter and, and, and hit an atom, we'll see that 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 atom, or rather the nucleus of an atom, um, recoil. So it's a single nucleus of a, a, a of an atom, sort of moving about a, a hundredth of a hair's width, and that's what we're trying to detect. But if you pick the right stuff, you can make pretty good detectors that can see that and sense that. Um, and so there's a few ways to do it. What, what one way is to try and do that and have you know direct detection which is to build these detectors trying to see um, just that type of event. And they use various technologies. Um, and, other, and, and then there are a few other ways of doing it as well. We might go to accelerators and smash particles together, you know, collide them together um, and try and recreate the conditions of the early universe. And see, so just as dark matter was born in the early universe, um, if we can get up to high enough energies, maybe it'll, you know, we'll see it there again. Uh, and then a third way of doing it is what's called indirect detection, um, which say, well, if dark matter is feeling gravity, you know, there's more of it presumably at the center of our galaxy or even at the center of the Earth or the Sun. Uh, and if if dark matter is its own antiparticle, then when they come together, if they come together, they'll annihilate uh, and turn into stuff that we are pretty good at detecting, like neutrinos or positrons or gamma rays. So you sort of three different uh, complementary ways of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I like direct detection. That, that, that's what I work on. Nice. Thanks for that. So then coming back to you, Yuchen. So um, maybe you can show us a bit more using the slides. Um, but how do you uh, illustrate those ways of detecting dark matter then in, in this piece? Um, I guess um, if we could show the um, number three um, slide, um, which is very much about my um, sort of my script um, writing here. Um, so I use various way of um, sort of uh, um, writing down this um, how the science is done. So there's a little bit of science going on there, but there's also a lot about how I am um, sort of navigating. If you can see the number three slides. So on the right-hand side column, these are the potential candidate of a very stark matter. Um, and I found those 
that obviously there's uh, this uh, communication, this language problem. And so I found those words particularly uh, interesting. I guess that's what you heard. Like for example, um, Gang, um, earlier what Chan was saying, uh, WIMPs or um, weekly um, interactive, um, interacting massive particles, for example. And I found those words are super um, interesting. And if we can also have a look at um, number, uh, number four slide. Um, which is um, images that I have um, collected from various um, experiments and I kind of make that into um, also almost like animating this um, archive um, images. And if we can have a look at number five slides. And um, we can have a look at number five slides. Um, so number five slides is um, the way how this piece of work is actually presented. So obviously we look at the, um, the drawing earlier, this two meter long drawing is almost being archived and been preserved inside this, um, so the museum, almost like a museum object and it has this very sort of strong um, sculptural quality. And if we look at number um, six and seven images, and then you arrive, this is how the work is actually being presented um, in the gallery. Um, so this, um, th this plane, is, um, or like this study of uh, dark matter is almost like this um, island in the middle and the audience kind of finding their way um, sort of being guided by um, the, the sound work and the voiceover, which is very directional. And so the audience is uh, almost like swimming in this massive big ocean, um, ocean of um, the massive big ocean of a science and um, trying to find their way, getting closer to, to this, this island. Um, within this, so the video, everybody just saw it, um, it's actually been projected directly onto the drawing. So obviously you have this drawing, which is very static. And um, if we can have a look at number eight slides and number nine. So obviously you have this drawing, which is very static. And it's almost like this metaphor of dark matter, which is there, it's always there, but it just, it depends on what kind of condition is get, get, we get given. And also if we have the right instrument or the right tools. Um, so when the projection is projecting onto the drawing, um, so the drawing is almost being conditioned um, because of the light source um, coming from the video. Um, so a lot of time, like earlier you will see, it was if the, if the video is completely black, now meaning that um, the audience are not allowed to see the drawing. And if it's completely white, then you are allowed to see. And so it's like this, I'm trying to replicating that experience of shifting in between allowed to see and not able to see. And if I can capture um, the right moment. And um, if we look at the um, slides number 10, I guess this gives a quite a good illustration of um, this drawing you only um, kind of reveal in a certain time. And I guess the audience is kind of navigating themselves within this, almost like my own experience, I navigating myself within this narrative of scientific discussion. I don't know, I don't understand, I understand. I, I think I understood a little bit more. And I'm always learning like, why do I want to know more? I guess that's what um, this piece is really trying to um, replicate in that experience. I guess it's nothing be the same, um, you know, when we are trying to talk about this piece um, online. And it, it, it would not be the same if this piece is actually being experienced um, as an as a, as a installation work. Um, yeah, hopefully the exhibition will get to open at some point. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so how much of that then is influenced by working with these scientists? Like, did you take much influence from, say, the scientific method in, in approaching that? Um, yes, I, I think um, the, I think there's one thing quite amazing is about standing uh, standpoint. And um, in particular, like I remember I went to UCL to see to see Charm and I, I, I was telling him like when I was working with him, when I, I was talking to him, I felt like playing computer game. It, it's like almost like I'm zooming in this massive big machine. No, actually, I'm talking about this tiny little minute detail of something invisible. And, and so th this kind of navigation, um, it's it just um, incredible. And I guess I try to include as much um, ab about all these um, ways of seeing within, um, in particular, the, the script writing here. Um, and, and, you know, like this idea of um, going down in a deep mind and um, 
that this is very much, a, um, I guess Chung can tell us a little bit more about the experiment that he's been doing. And, and also like talking to Malcolm is, okay, we're talking about the galaxy and um, it's miles away and it's about actually the things already happened long time ago. So I really need to kind of get my head around in terms of thinking about the, the massive, the big, and the, 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 the small, the, the tiny. Um, I guess this was um, quite an um, interesting perspective for me to, to, to take on. And also to think about how do I activate those through uh, video making and through um, you know, arranging time and also through um, sound work. Because um, you, you know, when you are actually in the exhibition, when you've got the headphone on, you're immersed in this sort of the scientific narrative and the scientific discussion. But then the sound, the voiceover is actually coming from all directions. And it's very much about that kind of my experience of swimming in this giant sea of science. And I just need to find a way to get in closer to the shore mm -hmm. if I ever had the chance. So I guess the flip side of that question, then I'll go to you first, Malcolm, because I know you were heavily involved in curating this exhibit in King's College. Um, how did you find working with the artist? And do you think that that's changed your perspective on your research at all? Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's really it's really challenging working with artists, but very gratifying I think it's really nice because it forces you to put your own work in perspective because um, you, you're really sort of stuck in the middle of an environment where you're surrounded by people who speak the same language of as you and understand have got the same background as you for many many years and um, to take yourself out of that and really try to explain some of these concepts in quite a lot of detail to somebody from a completely different background who views the world through quite different eyes I think it's uh, I think it's really good. Um, I think it's it sort of takes you out of yourself and puts your puts a lot of things in pers into perspective for a scientist, so that you can uh, gives you a new perspective on your daily life. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun talking to artists. Some of the questions they come up with are quite unexpected and and quite difficult to answer quite often as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah forces you to answer some simple questions that maybe aren't so simple <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and then I guess the same to you Sham like do you find that this has made you more curious about your research or change your perspective yeah it, it, absolutely I, I think the the certainly with with regards to my own research it's quite nice to sort of step back and explain uh, or, or talk about or think about you know the, the the overall sort of context sometimes you know you're stuck in a very nitty gritty piece of of work for a long time and often it's nothing well it is to do with dark matter but it's you know it's a technology or something and you forget the the, the bigger scheme uh, and and that's quite nice to kind of come out and say oh wow I, I'm spending my time thinking about how to find dark matter you know you can make up 80 plus percent of the the galaxy and I don't often actually sit with that um anymore uh, and, and so that, that's always quite nice. Um, and so it sort of situates me back, um, roots me somehow often uh, it, through these sort of conversations. But also, you know, similar to that sort of science communication aspect of, you know, explaining something um, in ways that, 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 that will make sense. And especially when it's not just an explanation, you know, it, as, as you Chen was saying, that sort of a dialogue of, okay, that didn't really make sense. I'm like, yeah, it didn't make sense to me either. Let me try again. And, and then trying other, other ways of explaining it. They're great um, because you come up with new sort of analogies and metaphor that, that, are, that, are, that are always, yeah, interesting and sort of mind opening. Uh, but, but then the, the, the most fun part, I think, and as Mark said, there's lots of challenges as well, but the, but the most fun part for me is just the, the um, trying to sort of relax my mind and be as open-minded as possible in the exploration uh, of, of you know someone else's um stance on their experience of of these big questions you know it's not it's not just the realm of uh, of science we're all in this dark matter um and so and so sort of stepping out of or, or stepping out of my own head as best i can um and really engaging in that process is always great fun yeah Wonderful. Right. Well, um, I want to get on to some Q&A soon enough. Um, but before I do that, there's another um, question that I wanted to ask, which is um, 
more topical today in light of COVID-19, there's a lot of focus on applied research and how fundamental research is. Um, But I think often the general public doesn't understand the importance of basic research, or as we call it, blue sky research. Um, So I wanted to ask, um, this is open to anyone, so anyone can jump in really. Can you explain um, what, uh, or how important basic research is to you, or why do you think that it's so fundamental? So, I mean, there's some obvious spin-offs from the kind of research we do. We, we create people who are very numerically skilled and they can use computers and what have you, and they can do computer modeling. And indeed, some of the top epidemiologists in the UK who featured in the news lately uh, come from a particle physics background, actually. Um, so, and quite a lot of the people who leave physics or don't go on to become a professor like Cham and me, they, they go into things like big data and what have you. And, and quite a lot of people go into things like um, computer models of protein folding, for example. So there's, those are some immediate um, spin-offs. And there's, there's quite a lot of technological spin-offs as well, which I'm probably Cham can talk, tell you about in more detail than I can. Yeah, I mean, uh, te- technological spin-off, j- j- just, just off, you know, there, there are some big ones that, that, that get cited, like the internet. Uh, you know, coming from from the uh, from the collider and the LHC and 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 these uh, and and many others. You know, there's things like lots of um, fMRI innovation, PET scanners, lots of stuff that we use in medicine and and engineering filtration systems. A lot of this stuff actually comes from, um, or, or some of the R and D and the innovation for that comes from from experimentation, going to try and prove or disprove or understand some of this blue skies research. And so the the importance of it is, you know. The, of course, there, there's there's an element of how does this translate into the real world, um, but that that often comes after the big questions, I guess, at least for me, right? As in, well, what is this world? Can we can we get at that first? And and you know, what, what is what, what is actually going on here? And, and how best to understand that and put that in some context, given that we're sensory beings with a very limited um, window. You know, the electromagnetic spectrum that we pick up with our eyes, well. You know, we, 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 we don't see the microwaves, but we use microwave cookers and we don't see the radio waves, but we have radios. This is all fundamental science, right? This is where it all, all, all comes from. People, curious folk trying to understand just what was going on and extend the reach of, of their, um, their sensory perception. And, and then what we go and, and do with that, sure, that, then that the, you know, the applied nature of, of, of that is all very important. So we, ha- we have that sort of technological part of it translation the understanding of it that we pass on and then the people themselves i think is key and, and we've seen now you know with with coronavirus and so forth that the the, the number of teams and research and there's an element of you know our, our research labs for example just handed over all our, our personal protective equipment to the nhs because we had clean room git and all that kind of stuff but then a lot of folks sort of switch to um uh data analysis uh, and, and switch their teams and their own focus for a bit on to try and understand this data. Um, and then there are, there, are, there are sort of broader programs as well where we're trying to sort of translate our um, understanding, you know, multidisciplinary collaboration. So the, the way that science works, international kind of global science, um, we're all shooting for the same target. You know, like we've got lots of folk competing, like, like genuinely competing for funding and all this kind of stuff but actually all part of the same team. You know, we all want to know what dark matter is. And that, that's, um, that's sort of unique. You know, when I think about it in the sense of even NGOs or corporations or governments, science is one of the only areas where we do that. You know, thousands of people working together for decades for, for the LHC. And that, that, the, the way in which that, you know, we, we can start to translate um, how we work and bring some of that sort of technical divert some of that this this expertise and know-how to tackle some of our global problems like this current pandemic it's been really it's been amazing to see it's the kind of thing that I want to see more yeah Yeah, I completely agree and I really like that you hit on there or how you know applied research we get applied research from having had basic research and so I think that's so important but coming to you you Chen from a non-scientific perspective why do you think um, 
blue sky research, you know, mm. uh, asking all these questions of the universe and just basic curiosity. Why is that so important? Um, I think it's very important. I, I guess we get used to um, so much thinking about, is this useful for me in the short term? And, you know, no one knows, um, not until later on is, um, is Higgs boson, is discovery of Higgs, is it useful for me? Um, not until we find a way how to use it. Um, I guess that's the same analogy with arts. Um, if you think about how, how, how is this art or visual art useful for me, but it cannot be more important, especially um, during the pandemics, how much we are living in the world of confinement and isolation and arts actually, without arts, we probably were feeling pretty miserable, I guess. Um, I guess this, um, from the artistic perspective, um, is the fundamental thinking about humanity and thinking about our our world and thinking about our life. And I guess that's a task for all artists and also for all scientists, I guess. Um, um, so I, I think it's fundamental and there's no need to even try to emphasize how important that is. Um, it's the same thing, like I don't need to talk more about why is art important because it's there, it's in our everyday life and it's within you and me and everyone. Hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So thanks very much, guys. I'm going to go into some Q&A here. So um, for everyone watching, if you want to ask a question, you can just put it in the comments. Um, so yeah, I guess the first question I will ask here um, is to you, Chen. So um, would you like to explore more art science collaborations in the future following this, this work? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> And I, I guess the, the whole thing, uh, I guess it come across in my script uh, very much is I'm really being forced to try to think about everything from all different directions. Um, and I remember um, Malcolm was telling me about essentially you come up with an idea and you try your best to kill it. And if you realize if you cannot kill it, it's probably likely to be right. And I thought, wow, this is so philosophical. And, 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 and I love that whole thing um, about, um, you know, if you're thinking about this uh, astronomical observation, but then how can this one day becomes philosophical speculation? And so I, I, I think I'm totally challenged in, in many ways. And, and, and if I can try to think about how do I exhaust all the possibilities? It's very much like how an artist work is I come up with the idea and I try to so much to disprove everything until the moment I actually uh, deliver that into a piece of work and then it turned into something um, or something else. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Um, and then to Malcolm and Sham. So this is a possibly a tough question now. So how close do you think we are to the day when we can say what dark matter is and how it works? <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> you can work on the press release. <laughs> so is your machine working yet, Cham? Your new it, it, Are you it, gonna tell them about your new machine you're installing? Yeah, I can maybe maybe yeah, we'll tell you uh, we'll tell you where we are there. So 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 we don't you know, dark matter may be one of many things, but what if it is if it is weakly interacting massive particles or, or, or other things like that. Um, then one of the experiments that, that we're that we're working on at the moment is called it's called LZ or Lux Zeppelin. It sort of brings together um, lots of experiments that we did in the UK to develop a, a particular technology that uses um, a xenon target, uh, and then the American program um, called Lux. So so and it, and it's a it's a big it's a big detector. It's sort of seven tons of of liquid xenon, um, and this xenon you, you you get it out from the atmosphere. Uh, and then you cool it to, to about minus 110 degrees and it just becomes fantastic at detecting you know I mentioned uh, you know we're, we're looking for a, a nucleus of an atom recoiling about hundreds of a hair's width or so so, so that that kind of that kind of tiny minuscule uh, event happening maybe once every few months um, actually would light up the detector uh, it's it's fantastic. Xenon gives you a huge sort of flash of light and 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 also this ionization. So so that that detector is coming together, and it was just before the, the sort of the lockdown and and um, uh, for 
you know, the sort of global lockdown really kicked in, we, we just about got to a point where everything, all the detector, all the innards and everything for that detector are now sealed up um, in, its, in the cryostat, which is basically a thermos flask. So all this liquid xenon, got to keep it cold, got to keep it pure and clean. Then you have to put it in a, in a big thermos flask. For ours is made of titanium. Uh, and within that thermos flask is basically a bucket with, with light sensors. We, we, we want to be able to, to detect any light that we get from it. Um, so it sounds quite straightforward. It took you know five years or so to, to actually build and, and put together, and um, but it builds on you know what we've done in the past. And that this will be once it turns on, um, it will be the most sort of advanced uh, dark matter detector for this type of dark matter that, that we've ever that we've ever built. Um, and so within sort of a few months of operating it, uh, we'll be into into parameter space, in, into uncharted territory. Basically, we'll, we'll be probing our um, you know the, the potential dark matter around us with a sensitivity that we've never had before some hundred times better than, than we've ever had so that that was going to turn on um around june july so that's not going to happen um we mm. still we've closed it all up it's all kind of ready to go we just need to inject the xenon in it make sure everything's working and then and then start the science run uh and so yeah lockdown plus six months Lockdown end plus six months. Uh, you'll you'll be hearing from us. That's the um, that's assuming it is that kind of dark matter. I'm extremely excited to see what the Lux Zeppelin experiment discovers, but it's possible that it might not discover dark matter because the dark matter might not want to interact with us, and it might be a lot more difficult to find it. And you know, it could be one year, it could be ten years, it could be a hundred years, it could be a thousand years, or we might never detect it directly in other words it will never hit us there is a possibility that that's true in yeah. which case we're just restricted to some of the things that we're trying to do at the moment which is as well as trying to work out how you can detect it by interacting with it trying to see how it behaves around us in the universe whether it clumps together on small scales and whether it creates lensing whether we can find out more about it simply because of its gravitational effect inside galaxies so there's no easy answer to the question we could discover it very very soon or it might take forever or we might never discover it yeah and that brings me to what i was going to ask you actually as well malcolm um so what's next or what are you doing currently at king's um in relation to that so in figuring out how this might interact so we're trying to see how it deflects light if so one of the things we're trying to do is if it's a bit different so that it doesn't make chams detector go bing can, can there can, are there other ways to detect it um, and one of the ways is if it gets hit on the way here and so it's accelerated and then it still might make Cham's detector go bing. But another, another way is just to see what effect it's having on, on light in the universe because stuff that weighs stuff, this matter, this dark matter, it changes the way that light moves through the universe. So by looking at the, the way that light gets bent by this matter, um, because as Einstein showed, the uh, matter bends the fabric of space-time and then light follows curved paths through space-time. So if you've got lumps of dark matter flying around, it can change the way that light, light travels. And by analyzing that, we're hoping to find out more about what it's doing. And that, that doesn't mean that we have to detect it because even if we can't interact with it, we can still see its gravitational effect on light. So that's one of the things that we're looking at at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Um, and just come back to you, Yu Chen. I wanted to ask if there's for, for people who get to see your piece, um, if there was one thing they were to take away from it, what what would you want that to be? Be it a new curiosity for dark matter or something else? Um, yeah, I think definitely a, a different way of seeing different way of seeing things or different way of experiencing and, and, and finding out. Um, I, I guess this, uh, it, it's, I guess, um, I mean, I'm speaking really very much about the installation piece is that sort of being guided into the theater, almost like a theater, theatrical piece, but you don't know what to expect. And I guess a lot of artists and scientists are working towards um, you know, a territory of unknown and, and you don't really know what to expect. But then when you see, it, it's like, wow, what, what do I do with this information? And I guess that's kind of a back and forth um, what I have been experiencing um, a lot. Um, and I guess um, I try to make people see things differently or, or to, to think about um, life or, or the world in a very different way. 
Okay, lovely. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in here. So unless there's any parting words anyone wants to wants to share with us, um, I might leave it there. So um, you, I guess I, I quite like to ask the scientists what they think about, um, you know, when we don't know what to do with the research, we turn ourselves into science fiction or do we turn ourselves into um, philosophical approach? Um, I, I don't know. What, what do you guys think about that? So what, what do you mean when we don't know what to do? You, you mean like um, now? Pandemic? Yeah, you're in the midst of your research. Um, so do you then start to dream of um, maybe sci-fi is the solution or, or like what I wrote in my script, um, it's this hurricane of dark matter coming into the earth and smashing everything or maybe this dark matter actually not living in the same dimension as us, it's living in the fourth or the fifth or the sixth dimension and you will never find it because maybe you're looking the wrong way. I mean, for me, it, the, the, the dark matter, I guess, what, one, of, one of the risks with being an experimental physicist is that we end up getting attached to a project or we're working on a project because that, that's the, you know, there's a lot to it. There's R&D first, there's, you know, all sorts you have to do, there's funding and da 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 da. But ultimately, what we're after is just trying to understand what dark matter is. So, so the, the broadening the technologies, I, 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 at the moment, I found myself thinking a lot more about quantum sensors and how we get into into you know other types of dark matter, um, things that would be far you know, signals that would be far too subtle for the current technologies that I'm that I'm working on at the moment, you know, or the LZ detector uh, to find, or you know, how we might improve it, how we might go after other types, and then when we get into sort of the quantum realm, then then yeah, then it becomes quite uh, philosophical, but not not overly, I guess, because there's there's some understanding of of what might be going on. Um, I'm not sure that completely answers your question. A bit, a bit of both. Sci-fi sci is all fun because quantum sensors could be very interesting also in the applied science sense of things. You know, we get more physicists working with these things and then what might we be able to sense um, in terms of, you know, neuroscience and things like that as well uh, for, for kind of the way the world is at the moment. But, but in terms of what dark matter is, um, yeah. I don't know, uh, maybe over, over to Malcolm. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of things that need investigating, which will help us learn more about dark matter. And, and also, the, some of the technologies that people like CHAM are developing, they can help us to look for other particles in different ways. So, for example, neutrinos. And I'm, I'm hoping that not necessarily LZ, but some of the other neutrino detectors around the world, so dark matter detectors around the world, can be can also help us answer some questions about some of the other particles like neutrinos coming from the sun because there are things about the sun that we don't understand even though it's very bright and it's obviously out there all the time so um, there's there's lots of different things that we can do even if we don't necessarily get a, a, a gold plated signal of dark matter right here and now we can still spend a lot of time working out more about its nature and what it's doing in the universe and the technologies that we're developing to try and find it can be used for lots of other things as well. So it's kind of a win-win in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm really quite excited about, you know, the stuff that, that Malcolm was talking about, you know, sort of looking out there, rather than detectors and things going ping and so forth, or trying to make it in accelerators and actually, just, you know, the, the granularity and the resolution with, you know, that we're approaching with mapping what's going on out there in the cosmos to give us a better idea of what the dark matter is doing um, that's really exciting for me. You know, whether we find anything down here um, in these detectors or not, that's that's bound to. I say that. I, I, I think that's bound to bring a lot of. You know, that, that that'll increase our understanding, even if we don't understand much more with, you know, null signals. But it, it, having said that, we do we do even null signals are always very good as well. But but I, uh, but yeah, the, the technologies that we're applying for imaging. Um, you know, pointing out of the earth are, are really very cool. Yeah, cool. Um, so I actually have another question that's just come in, come in now. Um, so uh, this is to you, Yuchen, I guess. Um, most art operates through contrasts, light and dark, for instance. Where can you find contrast in dark matter? Ooh, yeah. um, it's, 
is it there? Is it visible? <laughs> Not there. Um, it's almost like this on and off question. I, I don't. I, I don't think it's that straightforward. Um, there's so much in between the gray areas, and and I guess that's where it gets um, a lot more um, interesting. And it's the same thing. Like how I um, develop this piece. Is is it a, a, a piece of drawing? Is it a piece of um, film or is this a um, spoken words um, or is it a moving image um, it's insulation it's the whole entire experience that I'm trying to develop so it isn't just about the contrast it's really about the process and also there's so much um, you know there's so much to it than what you actually really um, can see on the on the surface um, I guess it takes time it, it really takes time for for for, the, for my audience I think in particular in particular um, all the different work I make I mean they, they always take so much time and painstaking um, process and it, it's it, it's not instant um, receiving and it needs time to 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 kind of let it sit there for a little bit and and yeah. Okay. And maybe it would take me for years to actually finish this work. Mm -hmm. I guess that's probably like the scientists would take years and years and try to tackle one question and or, or try to answer a question, I suppose. Yeah, I'm sure the physicists can agree. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, I've no more questions coming in here and we're at five too. So I think I'll I'll leave it there and thank you all. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation and I learned a lot. So I hope the people watching feel the same way. Um, I just want to uh, say to everyone as well that there will be more uh, virtual events as part of the exhibition. So if you want to see any of those or keep up to date with what's going on, you can go to the website. So that's dublin.sciencegallery.com. Um, you can also follow on Twitter. Um, and on Instagram. So uh, yeah, look for that to keep up to date with the events. So thanks everyone again. Thank, Thank you. you.